Thank you. It's great to be here. So this is a complete change of um, topic, perhaps, because I want to talk about neurobiology of emotions and the evidence for human interconnectedness. And the reason I am interested in this topic, besides being a neuroscientist, is that largely the scientific world is um, populated by materialistic views. Okay. That reduce the um, the human being to his material components, and that, despite the fact that we are all aware of how many of our operations and our functioning is in material. Now, there are some attempts at providing a better cohesive approach and some personalistic philosophies, for example, those proposed by Carol Butiwa and also the Etich von Hildebrand and others describe the human person not just as a body and soul, but as a body, psychic, and spiritual dimensions being. And that three-party, if you watch, um, presentation um, is very tightly intertwined, so much so that you can find manifestations of each of those components in every single aspect of any human being's life. So one of the things that um, this integrative view of the person provides is a good basis to understand relationality. In other words, the interaction of the person with the world and with other beings. And that in itself is something very uniquely human. Not that the rest of the material world doesn't interact, but the way it happens is very different. So I like to claim that science um, at large shows that humans are hardwired for close relationships, for close attachments to other people. And I would like to present a number of examples from the neurosciences that support the conclusion that the human person is hardwired for relationality and for connectedness. So what do I mean by this? Well, first of all, I use the term hardwire not in the um, in the uh, technical term, perhaps, but to indicate something that is biologically primed, discernible in the basic structure of the brain. And I'd like to propose that we are hardwired for close attachments to other people, as well as for moral meaning and openness to the transcendent that's present there, too. And why is this important, you may ask? Well, because meeting this basic need for connectedness, it turns out, is essential for um, human health and flourishing. And there is plenty of evidence to that regards. So I'll try to um, focus my um, examples into two main areas. The first one is that people working in neuroscience, brain researchers at large, and other fields too, indeed, are now clearly mapping what may be called a neurochemistry of connection. Take the case of the hormone uh, oxytocin that you surely have heard about. So oxytocin is a hormone that is mainly synthesized by cells in two nuclei in the brain called the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. They are in the hypothalamus, which is a brain region located deep in the brain and is surrounding a structure called the third ventricle. That's important because of the anatomical location also facilitates the function. And indeed, oxytocin is released to the general circulation through the pituitary, but also to other areas of the brain precisely by diffusion. So oxytocin has been shown as an important mediator of social behaviors, and for that reason, it's involved informing relationships and partnerships. And in particular, oxytocin is very prominently involved in mediating male-female bonding. There are very early studies by Turner and colleagues that showed, for example, that oxytocin is released into the bloodstream of females during intercourse. And they affect limbic areas of the brain and promote a bonding and also emotional intimacy. And other work by other uh, groups, for example, Janice 
Kinkle Glaser and colleagues from Ohio State have also documented the connection between very close sexual relationships, especially those of married couples, and other physiological measures of, um, brain, of human performance like immune system, endocrinological responses, and cardiovascular functions. And their work very strongly suggests that um, relationship intimacy is linked to the best health, to better health, including stronger immune systems and one of the ways that they measure this is by calculating how long it takes for a physical wound to heal. And they find that when there is a strong, solid relationship, the time it, a wound takes to heal is shorter than in, in, a, in a relationship of conflict. Those studies in humans uh, have also received strong validation through animal experiments, particularly using a very interesting mo model of prairie voles. Prairie voles are very highly affiliative animals. They form enduring bonds between both sexes, and they actually also provide biparental care to their offsprings. And for that reason, they are a very valuable model organism to examine social monogamy. In prairie voles, the expression of oxytocin receptors in the responsible areas is higher than other similar species, other non-monogamous other non prairie voles, and this fact also makes them very useful as models to investigate neural pathways in, involved in the formation of partner preference. There is a lot of work that has been uh, performed by uh, Larry Young at Emory and his colleagues documenting the importance also of social relationships for the individual's health. So, for example, they examine the negative consequences of breaking pair bonds or partner loss. So this is demonstrating the importance by showing what happens when you break it. So in prairie voles, for example, the oxytocin, when you block oxytocin receptors by infusing an antagonist into the cortex, then um, partner preference does not get bonded. And when you use also other more um, cutting edge contemporary techniques like optogenetic techniques, you can turn some pathways in the brain on and off um, at will kind of thing for the investigator. And you can show through those experiments that there is a dynamic communication between the prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens, and those are two areas critical for, for partner preference. So you can turn off those areas and show that there is no partner preference created um, and turn them back on and see the behavior develop. So, um, so that's another way to look at this. In these same animals, when you disrupt, um, when, when you disrupt the, the pair bond by separating the partners, the animals develop anxiety and depressive behavior. And also, mm, they develop a dysregulation in the cardiovascular system. So, um, and you can measure that by increased heart rate, for example, and reduced heart rate variability and other measures. Those are ex some examples. And these changes are, mm, are correlated or accompanied, actually, by a reduction in oxytocin. So, when you take male voles, from these pairs with the bond already created and you separate from their partner and they develop these symptoms. If you now in in inject or infuse their brains with oxytocin, those depressive behaviors resolve and they are reversed. And to confirm these kind of findings, what they do also is males, part of this pair bond, not separated, if you now in infuse in them a blocker of oxytocin, they develop the same um, kind of depressive behavior as the others. So many other studies have implicated other neurotransmitters and hormones in the bonding process, including dopamine and prolactin, other endogenous opioid peptides, steroid hormones such as estrogen, testosterone, and also progesterone. And for example, um, it's interesting that there is some, some data showing that the attachment hormones that are triggered 
by parental care, in turn also increase and reinforce parental care and further the release, increase the release of further hormones. For example, Dixon and George were the first to describe years ago the, that male marmosets, when they are holding their babies, the levels of prolactin hormone is five times higher than, we are, than when they are not uh, holding the babies. And this change had previously only described in females, so they interpret this as a mechanism to reinforce bonding behavior with their offspring. Something similar has been shown in humans. In human males, the steroid hormone is associated both with sexual desire and with aggression. However, a number of studies suggest that for men, becoming sexually and intimately bond with a spouse lowers testosterone levels. And Peter Gray and colleagues at Harvard found a number of years ago that after controlling for age, married men had lower testosterone levels than unmarried men. And the results also suggest that the time spent with their spouse, what they call spousal investment, correlates with lower um, testosterone levels and lower aggressive levels. The second um, aspect um, to look at this um, bonding is nurturing environments. Nurturing environments, or if you wish, the lack of those, can affect genes transcription and the development of brain circuitry. So findings in this regard kind of um, are somewhat moving the old-fashioned nurture versus nature uh, debate in different directions. But the main point I want to highlight now is how parenting influences offspring basic health and include also their capacity to respond to stress and how this, is, this effect of parenting is expressed genetically and passed to the next generation. This was um, alluded to earlier this morning. <coughs> the data now shows that this is transmitted even beyond the first generation. But there is a very extensive review by uh, Michael Meany from McGill that um, collects a lot of data um, to support the, the variations in that variations in maternal care alter the gene expression in the offspring the genes that regulate the behavior in the offspring and also neuroendocrine responses to stress and also synaptic development in the hippocampus, which will be measured later in life by changes in cognitive capacity in these models. But also very interesting, maternal behavior will change maternal behavior of the offspring. So the offspring later on when they become mothers will also operate in accordance to their, the, the type of care that they receive. So one um, or some of the strongest evidence for this environmental regulation in the development of responses to stress comes from work in rodents, but similar experiments or similar data can also be collected from humans. In rodents, um, the most common model is what they call the handling experiment and um, what they do is remove the pups for a few times during the, mm, the uh, infancy period and then measure their behavior at other times. And they, what they find is that mm, the pups that are separated from the mothers at different times develop a different response to stress. And I say different on purpose because it's questionable whether it's better or worse. It's better in some measurements, so it's um, better in terms of reactive to some stimuli, but worse performance in others. So I won't describe much of these experiments, but um, believe me when I say that, it's, it's worth exploring what that tells us also uh, for the human being. And the relevance is very uh, substantial. This has been highlighted, among other people, by Ruth Feldman from bar University in Israel in a recent review of the neurobiology of human attachment that you can look up. So she describes there um, a substantial body of work from both her laboratory and others showing how human bonds promote homeostasis, health, and well-being throughout life, how social attachments enhance health and happiness, while social isolation increases stress, impair health, and death. In fact, today most clinicians will agree 
that uh, one of the strongest predictors of death is social isolation. From a neuromolecular perspective, in humans as in other mammals, the development of bones also relies on the um, systems that maintain brain plasticity through a time-sensitive crosstalk between oxytocin and dopamine. And this is kind of interesting <coughs> since dopamine is well known as the hormone for um, the happiness hormone or the feel well kind of um, molecule. Indeed, this interaction highlights the, or reorganizes the neural networks around new attachments and also provide um, a, a saliency to those attachments that is maintained throughout life. And in a way, it kind of provides a support for this idea that these attachments are going to increase the perception of successful life, life throughout the whole lifespan. Um, there are, in humans, also a number of surveys um, and studies done with functional MRI that look at which areas of the brain um, are responding to a variety of social attachments. And there are quite a number of interconnected brain systems that integrate to establish, maintain, and enhance our affiliated bonds with others. And this makes also a lot of sense, precisely because the human brain in as a main difference with other animals, they have a um, large area devoted to association cortex. I wanted to also add two suggestions that Ruth Feldman um, brings forth in her work. One is that this um, neurobiology of affiliation that I've provided a super um, um, quick survey stands at the crossroads between science and the humanities with the potential to develop or provide deeper integration of the two after centuries of separation between those two distinct branches of knowledge. So I think that that would be interesting for people in this group that may be interested in breaching the, the divide there. And to that end, let me end with a quote from Ruth Feldman. She writes, to study the neurobiology of human attachment, one must season the objectivity of science with the wisdom of the clinician, foresight of the philosopher, and creativity of the artist into a unified endeavor that can shed new light on the loftiest and oldest of human experiences, which is love. And with that, I'll uh, take any questions if there are any. Thank you.